ass, screw 2016, let's talk about 2020, and it ain't about Kanye. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Motley Stew Show, where we talk about some of the bigger stories in politics and news each week, try to cut out the echo chamber and see what's really going on and why should it matter. On the day that I filmed this, Thursday, it's actually the day that Hillary Clinton spent a marathon 11 hours being interrogated by the Benghazi Select Committee. Now, this isn't the first time that she's testified. It's actually the second. And for the sake of the people who actually pay attention to this, I hope it's the last time that this committee actually is formed because it's the eighth investigation. But since that testimony just wrapped up a few hours ago, I didn't really have time to put everything together and to try to make that the show this week. So I was going with the story I originally went for, which was the chaos of the Speaker of the House race, which is now seemingly wrapped up by the wonder kid of the GOP, Representative Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan is a Republican congressman from Wisconsin. He was originally elected in 1999. He's 45 years old. Besides the fact that most people only know him because he was the VP pick with Romney, he's also held two other really big important posts inside the government. He was the chairman of the House Budget Committee from 2011 to 2013. He was also the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee since January of 2015, which is what he will be giving up to become the Speaker of the House. Now, the reason that Paul Ryan had to jump into this race and take over the speakership is because of the same thing that I talked about a few weeks ago when John Boehner said, I'm leaving. He basically got fed up with the idea of trying to wrangle in the entire House Republican Congress because it was splitting. You now have several factions inside the GOP caucus that are way more conservative than the others. The main part of that split is the House Freedom Caucus, which covers about 40 people. They're the ones taking credit for making John Boehner leave. They're also the ones taking credit for the fact that Kevin McCarthy dropped his bid for the speakership because they wouldn't endorse him. And without that block of 40, McCarthy didn't have enough overall, so he left. And he also didn't want to give into the demands that the House Freedom Caucus was making. Now, once he dropped out, everything went into chaos. There was no clear front runner to take the spot of John Boehner. The House Freedom Caucus has their person, a representative named Daniel Webster. He's been their pick. He ran against Boehner before and lost, but he's the pick of the House Freedom Caucus. But as soon as everyone started scrambling to see what name they could come up with that could replace Kevin McCarthy, Paul Ryan was floated almost immediately. But he responded, I don't want that job. And who would? It's practically the worst job on the Hill right now. Trying to bring together this GOP House right now, it's far from an easy job. These people do not vote in lockstep, at least not with each other. They vote in lockstep with their small groups now. And trying to make those groups agree is the same right now as trying to make Republicans and Democrats agree. Now, even Mitt Romney got into this when he made personal calls to Paul Ryan, basically telling him, you have to take this. You have to bring order to the House of Representatives. And the reason why they needed him so badly is because if they didn't, if Paul Ryan didn't take this job and he walked away from it too, the chaos would grow and it would show the Republican Party not only can't govern the country, they can't govern themselves. And going into an election year, this would be terrible, terrible optics for the party. So they needed this fixed and they needed it fixed fast. But let me say, Paul Ryan is not one person to be pushed over. He is young, he is smart, and he knows what he's doing. And that's why I said early on in the very beginning of this broadcast, let's think about 2020, because Paul Ryan is definitely thinking about 2020. While his position as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee is more powerful than the Speaker of the House, Speaker of the House is actually the third in line of the presidency in case anything happens. He's right under the vice president. And I'm not saying that's how he thinks he's going to become president, but it's a much more public figure. Less powerful, Power, more public. And more public means more airtime. More airtime means the country gets to know you better, and that means you get name recognition when you run for president in 2020, which I can nearly guarantee you he will do. Because of the fact that if he does bring the GOP together, if he makes the House work, he could be seen as the unifier, which is the type of person right now that Washington just does not have, and the country thinks doesn't exist. But to get that image, to make that the person that everyone thinks he is, he basically made a series of demands saying, if I take this job, you have to agree to certain things from me. As reported earlier this week by thinkprogress.org, he said, first, I must have a majority support from every caucus in the conference. Two, no pre-commitments made before becoming speaker. Three, rule change in the House, the main one being removing the ability of a group to make a motion to vacate the chair. And four, he gets to spend the time he needs with his family. Now, going over each one of these really quickly, they each have a very specific reason for being asked. And not only for the way that he's going to run the House, but again, the way he gets seen by the rest of the country. And the first one being, 
he wants majority support from every caucus in the House. And he was basically pointing this directly at the House Freedom Caucus, which to vote as a caucus, those 40 members have to usually agree at 80%. If they don't agree at 80%, then the individual members are free to vote the way that they want, but the House Freedom Caucus as a group will not endorse somebody. Now, immediately upon giving these demands, the House Freedom Caucus members, about 11 or 12 of them, went public saying they were completely disgusted with these demands and absolutely would not support him, which would pretty much take away the idea of getting 80%, but in the next few days, that seems to have wavered. And as of this morning, it seems like the House Freedom Caucus will endorse Paul Ryan, which made him say, I will run for speaker. But very quickly, I want to make a point about this. He's not running for speaker. This is all theater from this point on. There's no one running against him anymore, it seems. Nobody's even talking about Daniel Webster. I don't know where he went. As far as I know, he hasn't officially dropped out, but he ain't gonna win. So going back to that first demand, that's the unifier demand. That's the, I have to be seen as getting support from the entire conference. Then, Number two, no pre-commitments made before becoming speaker. This is a big one because he's basically telling the House Freedom Caucus, I'm not going to agree to any of your demands. I'm not going to agree to bring certain things to the floor. I'm not going to agree to take away certain things. I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to repeal Obamacare. I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to build the border fence. I'm not going to tell you I'm going to do anything until I get in the chair. Now, the power of that really relies on the third one, the rule change, basically taking away the power of the House Freedom Caucus to pull somebody out of the speakership. If you make it harder for any particular caucus to use the vacate the chair motion, that means you actually protect yourself as the speaker and lower the power of certain groups inside the house. This again is exactly what Ryan wants. He says, if I'm going to get in the chair, then I want to stay in the chair. And there's a quote coming from him that puts this really well. He says, I'll take arrows in my chest, but not in my back. And then for the time to spend with his family. He says family time is very important to him and he will not sacrifice that for this job. Now, specifically, a lot of people were like, well, we all want that. But what he's talking about is basically his weekends. A lot of people don't understand that when you do get voted in as congressman, and especially when you get voted to something as big as the Speaker of the House, you don't really have weekends anymore. You go fundraising, you go to various functions, you have to do various things, and you get paid very well for that, but still, you don't get to go home a lot. And he says he's not willing to do that. So he wants basically his weekends to himself. Now, it seems like a very small demand in the overall scheme of things. This is a very big part of the image that he wants to portray because the biggest type of person who runs for president is a family person. And up to this point, it's basically been a family man, you know, notwithstanding Hillary Clinton running right now. So this is all to craft his image for future run to the White House. Now, the interesting part is this morning, as I was driving to work, I turn on Glenn Beck and he is apoplectic. He is so upset because he's basically heard that Paul Ryan will become Speaker of the House and that the House Freedom Caucus, which many of those members are the type of people that go on his show. They're very, very conservative, libertarian bent, and very anti-establishment. And as much as people are trying to say that Paul Ryan is conservative, he is the establishment pick. He was Mitt Romney's vice president. So the idea that some of these particular politicians that Beck helped put in office by getting them on his show and getting his audience behind them, that would then turn around and pick Paul Ryan, basically he feels incredibly betrayed. Now, if you want to truly understand how much the House Freedom Caucus buckled and why Beck and other conservatives are so angry, is because before they supposedly endorse Ryan, there was a questionnaire put out for anyone who wanted to run for speaker. And you know, if you answered certain ways on this questionnaire, they weren't going to support you. So I've got a link to the questionnaire down below if you want to read the whole thing, but but here are some prime questions. Full repeal of Obamacare by the end of the year. Not going to get it. No debt limit increase unless tied to Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid cuts. Not going to get it. No funding for Obamacare, Planned Parenthood, Iran deal, and amnesty. Not going to get it. Impeach the IRS commissioner. Not going to get it. Commit to Representative Labrador's First Amendment Defense Act. Not going to get it. So those are five of the big ticket things on the questionnaire, and they're going to get none of those. There's no way that Paul Ryan is going to bring those down to the House floor because the fact is he wants to seem like he can make government actually work again. So he's not going to continue to bring bills to the floor of the House that he knows are just going to get killed in the Senate or vetoed by President Obama. Now, besides the people in Congress who are actually supporting Ryan, but there's a surprise announcement of support when this Wednesday he was given the Lean In Award, which is usually reserved for females. Now, the reason that he was given this was because they wanted to support the fact that he mentioned family time being so important to him. And they want to support the idea of a man, of the father of the family, also making a statement saying family time is important to the father as well. It shouldn't just be the mother that stays home and takes care of the kids. The father should be an equal and balanced part of that family unit. So they gave him this daily award to basically support him for that 
that cause. But immediately there was some backlash from not only feminists, but also liberals and some conservatives because of the fact that Paul Ryan voted against so many things that support women's equality. He voted against the Lilly Ledbetter Act. He voted against the Paycheck Fairness Act twice. A lot of the cuts he wanted to make when he proposed his original budget back in 2011 would have disproportionately affected women and poor people. His support for women and what they need for family time and paid family leave has been notoriously low. So the idea that he's some sort of champion now leaves people a bit confused. And one last thing before we go, another little note about Paul Ryan, and he will deny this now, but it is totally true, is he's been a long time subscriber to Randian philosophy, to Ayn Rand, and the idea of this pure form of libertarianism. And if you haven't read where this comes from, pick up a copy of Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead and you will see what Ayn Rand philosophy is. Now he's actually given speeches to the Ayn Rand society, so this isn't just some fleeting thing that he picked up in college. He subscribes to this for very many, many, many years, and I think he still does, but he also knows it's deeply unpopular as a political philosophy. It doesn't work. So he's a little bit less public about it now and even pushes back against the idea that that's the only way that he thinks. But P.S., if you do pick up a copy of Atlas Shrugged, good luck. I've been trying to read my way through that for over a year. It's dreadful. But that brings me to the question for this week. What do you think about Paul Ryan for the pick of Speaker of the House? Do you think he's just using this as show for 2020? Do you think he can actually unify the GOP? Or do you think it's just gonna be business as usual? Let me know in the comments down below. Thanks again for watching another episode of The Motley Stew Show. If you haven't subscribed to the show yet, you can do so above. And I got two little buttons up here that you can subscribe to the whole channel or you can subscribe just to the daily vlogs that I've been putting out. Either one's great. You can also like, favorite, or share this video anywhere and to anyone you think might wanna join in the discussion. Stay tuned for next week. And here's one of the kids. Here I think about deep things. Black holes. Space-time continuum. Ponder the universe. So after he defended her, she did not give him the same latitude, even though she knows he's not a gun advocate and he's not against gun safety legislation. She saw the open shot and she took it. And remembering that you can only control your reactions and your emotions. You can't control other people's actions and you can't take responsibility for them as well all the time.